watching watch the recording ashok we are some more have logged in let me see Okay. Okay. Welcome all, all our club rotarian. I can see a lot of them have logged in. I think we should start, Shushila. It's seven thirty, right? I call the 27th meeting of RCBC, Rotary Year 23-24, to order. Uh, let us observe one minute silence for the world peace. Thank you. May I request uh, Club Secretary Suman to make her announcement, please? Suman, over to you. Yeah. Thank you, Gandhi. Hello, everyone. Uh, Happy New Year to all of you. Uh, announcements uh, starting with the birthdays and wedding anniversaries. We have uh, two birthdays in the coming week. Uh, starts with uh, Naz Shabir. She celebrates her birthday on 9th of January. And on 10th of January, we have Swarupa Ganesh who celebrates her birthday. Uh, we wish both Naz and Swarupa a great year. Um, we don't have any wedding anniversaries in the next one week. Uh, coming to the meetings, um, you know, uh, we have the uh, GOV on January 11th. Uh, request all of you to please attend without fail. And uh, tomorrow we have the mock GOV uh, in the afternoon. That is uh, uh, followed by the board meeting on Sunday. Uh, the board meeting is being hosted by uh, Raju Rane at RMB Club. And all the board members along with their spouses are invited. Yeah, that's it from my side, Karki. Thank you. Thank you, Suman. Now we have a very interesting project presentation. This is uh, an, an ambulance for the animals, which is probably hitherto no Rotary Club has done it. I'd, we would rather hear it from our own Rotarian uh, than me speaking something. So I'd request Venkat to start his uh, presentation, please. Over to you, Venkat. Thank you, Gargi. I'll uh, keep it very. Uh... Uh, concise. Uh, I am not presenting anything on uh, you know on this, but I would like to speak about uh, this particular project. So uh, most of our Rotarians would know about uh, the ambulance that we donated to Wild World Trust last year. Uh, this trust is run by a gentleman called Rajesh, who was awarded by us for vocational excellence three years ago. So he is a resource person even for the, uh, uh, the forest department on urban wildlife. So he's an extremely uh, 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 you know, useful and resourceful person in rescuing urban wildlife, rehabilitating them, and then, then releasing them back into the forest. He has made thousands of rescues. This is not just about uh, animals that are in uh, distress because of an accident or an injury but also animals that have been poached 
and illegally brought into Bangalore, etc. So uh, one of the uh, problems that he had expressed was that they had a little bit of a mobility issue when they rescued wild animals, you know, like snakes or barn owls or, uh, you know, uh, a multitude of uh, monkeys of those animals. They had an issue rehabilitating them. So they expressed their need for an ambulance, which would cut that uh, uh, the, uh, the time to transport them to a medical facility or back into the forest and things like that. Uh, so last year, we, uh, you know, uh, RCBC donated an ambulance uh, to Rajesh and his trust. Uh, very recently, Shabir had shared a, a brief report on what the ambulance has been doing. Needless to say, they have made hundreds of rescues. On the day that he took delivery of the vehicle, he rescued two cobras. On the way uh, to his uh, trust, you know, with the new vehicle, they rescued two cobras. So that's the kind of use that the ambulance has been put to. One very uh, major thing that they, they did recently was, uh, you know, uh, uh, releasing a rhesus macaque back into its original habitat at Pune. So this uh, particular uh, uh, monkey was illegally brought into Bangalore a couple of years ago. This was rescued by Rajesh and his team. And then it was rehabilitated at uh, Panergata. And once this fellow picked up, uh, you know, and he, he, he became healthy, it was time to actually release him into his wild habitat, which is around Pune. So they actually drove this guy from Bangalore to Pune in our ambulance. And he has been successfully released in the forest at uh, Pune. So, uh, phenomenal use uh, from the ambulance. That's one uh, thing that I just wanted to share as a project update to everybody at Rotary. Secondly, uh, Rajesh is also coming up with an experience center right next to the Jarak Bande forest. There are two major forests in Bangalore. One is Jarak Bande and one is Turali. You know, Turali, of course, has uh, been uh, encroached upon. Jarak, but right next to Jarak Bande, he has a one and a half acre uh, plot that he has taken up where he uh, is building his experience center. This center is essentially for children, for corporate uh, citizens and, you know, and, and even for the general citizens to come and build their awareness around wildlife and environment. Uh, he also plans to take them on a, on a trail within the forest and on a bird watch and all that. So, uh, we, uh, the community service team and uh, the board, you know, we are posing to support him on this project as well because educating our people is paramount today. And uh, if uh, everything works out well, we would be participating in that project as well. Very proud to say that we are one of the very, very few clubs that have actu act actually participated in some wildlife uh, 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 work. And... Uh, no one better than Rajesh and uh, WWT uh, for this particular uh, task. I would like to thank Gargi, thank Shabir and you know uh, the uh, the previous board for approving and uh, releasing this ambulance. Uh, I would uh, I'll try and plan a visit to his experience center one of these days where all of us Rotarians can go there, and we'll also make sure that all our Interact clubs, Interact schools, and Rotract colleges are also given an opportunity to go and experience the experience center, you know, the wildlife and environment there. So, uh, rightly, as uh, Sushila rightly mentions, it, it could be our vocational visit as well. So, we'll work that out, uh, Sushila. So, that's about it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Venkat. In, uh, as, uh, definitely, as we are looking forward to a long-term association with this uh, uh, service, Okay, because it's a service of different kind. Yes. Uh, as you also mentioned, that hardly any Rotary Club have probably worked in this domain. So yes. definitely we will try to do our best. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so much, Gargi. Thank you. Thank you. Now may I request uh, Shushila to introduce our this evening's speaker, Dr. Ashok Gopinath. Thank you very much, Gargi. Uh, you know, when uh, uh, Kyle called up saying that the vocational committee would like to look at uh, some new vocations for this month, 
and could we invite speakers who who uh, come from some different evolving areas of uh, professions to address us the first person that came to mind was ashok because i met him a few weeks ago at uh, at a conference and i uh, was really really impressed with the kind of work that they are doing in particular making genomics which for the lay person is is something uh, that happens in in the air in a lab somewhere but actually bringing it to the consumer and making it something that will matter to the individual to every one of us and a lot of what he explained to me and talked to me about how our dna and our genes impact our own health uh, made me think that this would be something that is useful for uh, every one of us to be aware of and know about and so thank you so much ashok for uh, agreeing to speak to us ashok by the way is a rotarian himself um, by way of introducing his background he is a phd in genomics from the indian institute of science and did his post doctoral research from cornell university in the us um subsequently he's worked in the biotech and pharma industry and uh, in in organizations such as such as sanofi illumina and um, uh, others uh, and he's he's really focus has always been on uh, the area of obviously of genomics uh he currently works with um with strand life sciences uh and uh, and he is going to talk about uh, about the work that that he's doing there but the the idea is how do you look at genomics as something that impacts wellness rather than something that uh, we we look at when we fall sick and need to do something about it the other thing is that he is also the founder director of an organization and not for profit called the genome bridge uh, which looks at creating access to genomic data uh, again the idea being uh, you know can can this data be used to uh, to particularly uh, diagnose rare diseases genetic diseases and so on and uh, so with with that very brief introduction he's got a fabulous i mean his his uh, detailed cv runs for many pages and he's he's done a lot of academic work as well uh, but with this brief introduction over to you ashok and once again thank you ever so much for agreeing to do this for us great um thanks so much sushila that was a great introduction um and yes uh, i'll just reiterate a few points in there that probably have some bearing on the talk today uh, yes uh, i'm a scientist who spent some time in genomics uh, yes i'm a rotarian I'm proud to be a rotarian um, and uh, uh, it's always wonderful uh, you know hanging out with other rotarians and and seeing the many contributions that the rotary makes um, i was attracted uh, to becoming a rotarian Uh, because of the kind of uh, selfless work that actually happens in these organizations that impact large communities um, and and my own embrace of genomics today uh, is towards getting scale uh, in delivering genomics uh, to large societies and i hope that i'll give uh, everyone a flavor of uh, what is possible uh, obviously um, Uh, it's a deep subject uh, one can jump into it and not stop talking about it tomorrow morning we can all be on this call uh, i would argue some of you would not find it as interesting as the others but bear with me because i try every now and then to create a summary slide so if i've lost you at a slide or two maybe two slides later i'll summarize everything and you can catch up uh, with everyone as well i do make some um, i do throw some big words every now and then uh, just from force of habit Uh, feel free to uh, pause uh, and and ask me to uh, explain i'm happy to do that um the challenge i always face when i talk to uh, such an august group of people is you're all learned you're all well meaning and you're all extremely interested in what happens and of course you come from different walks of life so you approach the same uh, same discussion um from different angles uh, and i welcome that because uh, i think that is the only way to bridge the gap uh, between what is available uh now in terms of access to genomics and what should be available so um i'll take you through a bit of a 
historical journey uh, at first uh, in, in, into where how we've got to where we are today. Uh, I'll try to make that as brief as possible and hopefully as interesting as possible. Uh, and then I'll just deviate into a few um, into a few specific areas. Uh, if time's running out, I'll just skim over them. If we get some time to go into it, I'll jump a few, uh, into a few details. And then finally, I'll give you one slide on what we are doing right now at Strand Life Sciences and how that might impact all of you uh, so that there is some continuity after my talk if you wish to proceed to learn more uh, and interact more with genomics. Uh, that opportunity is there. So uh, I'm going to just share my screen. Bear with me a second. Uh, I would love if one of you could confirm that you can actually see my screen. Yeah, we can. Sure. Yeah. Yes, we can see it. Okay, great. Um, uh, so uh, for the, I, I put that picture in there because I'm not, uh, not all scientists are uh, glum and serious. Uh, sometimes we can smile. Uh, but, uh, but the fact is we're scientists, so for most of the time we're buried in someone's lab, right? Uh, I found out uh, very late in life that the, that the way, the only way we can impact uh, life uh, the society is with, with the things that we do in the lab is to actually get out of it. And so I've embraced this opportunity and I really want to thank Sushila one more time for inviting me to uh, be able to interact with all of you here. Uh, uh, as briefly mentioned by Sushila, I have some credentials in the space, uh, which uh, took me some time and, uh, 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 you know, uh, in, in, and gave me a lot more understanding and appreciation of the world of genomics. Um, Today, I specifically titled the talk Genomic Applications and Disruptions. Uh, honest confession, uh, I had given this talk in the Rotary Lake Worlds Club that uh, uh, I've, I've been, uh, that I'm a part of. Uh, but uh, that was about three months ago, four months ago. If some of you got a chance to listen in, great. If not, no worries. Um, much of it would be repeated, about 60%, but about 40% of it is new. And it's new, not because I think we should put new material in, it's because the field of genomics is evolving so quickly that in the last four months, there have been some really profound changes. Um, uh, in fact, since I met Sushila a few weeks ago, there have been some profound changes uh, in the world of genomics, and I'll allude to one or two of those changes uh, in this discussion. Um, a brief disclaimer, I'm currently an employee of Strand Life Sciences, but today I reserve the right to speak freely with you about my own opinion. Uh, so feel free to ask me uh, uh, any questions you may have, uh, they don't necessarily reflect uh, the views of the organization I work with right now. So let's let's get down to the basics now, right? I mean, this whole talk is going to be out about DNA. It's a it's a spoiler alert that I'm going to give you, right? Um, what is DNA, right? So our human bodies, all of us, are made up of trillions of cells, uh, which I kind of indicated with these two little stick figures here on the side, right? Trillions of cells and and the cells are of different types. You have epithelial cells, muscle cells, but common to all of these cells is a biochemical molecule called DNA, abbreviated as DNA, or deoxynucleic acid. Um, uh, it's a biochemistry that I spent a lot of my PhD time getting associated with. Um, and I have actually grown uh, in the area of understanding it from what was such a difficult field to understand to now this is, an, this is a routine thing that we do every day. Right. So these trillions of cells have uh, have DNA in there. And this DNA is is a template molecule from which every element of your cellular construction is actually made up of. All right. So uh, imagine it's a code of which the cellular processes actually uh, read information and make uh, macromolecules like proteins and lipids. And, uh, and those kinds of things that, again, then go up to make the cells, that then go up to make the tissues, that go up to make the organs, that go up to make your body, right? Uh, and so uh, I, I'll, I'll call out one, um, uh, one exception uh, to, um, to, uh, of a cell type that doesn't really have a nucleus, that's the RBC or the red blood cell. And the reason I'm bringing it up is because it shows up later in my talk again uh, because we deal with some some um, some disorders that actually are impacted by uh, in the the RBCs are impacted by. Getting back to DNA, all these cells have um, have this biochemical molecule called deoxynucleic acid, and essentially you can count it as some kind of biochemical code 
that we've deciphered over time. Nobel Prizes were won to decipher it, right? But we've deciphered as humans, as a human race, we've learned to decipher it over time. And if we, if we add all these letters that constitute this DNA molecule, uh, we would have 3 billion letters, right? So uh, there are essentially only four letters that comprise this big molecule. Uh, we abbreviate them as A, T, G, and C. Right? They stand for uh, scientific names and chemical names, but ATGC is what we you normally associate uh, with these molecules or bases. And all these, all of our DNAs have only these four bases, A, T, G, and C. And the way in which they're organized, the sequence in which they occur, determine how you are different from me, how I am different from a chimpanzee, how a chimpanzee is different from a dinosaur. All right? uh, but all living forms have DNA in them barring a few viruses that are RNA viruses, right? So uh, um, the, the bottom line is that all of us have 3 billion letters sitting inside our cells, and we have a trillion cells. So we have a lot of DNA in us, and it's floating all around our, uh, our systems. It's in, it's in every tissue type. Uh, the middle column that you see here is basically a representation of how this DNA is organized and many people represent it like this. You may have seen when people talk about DNA, they show it like this. This is just the what we call a second order structure of DNA. So while at its very uh, primary structure, it has these four bases. What happens is, and I'll go take your focus to the right uh, panel here. So what happens in, 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 uh, in the cell is that um, DNA wraps around proteins and tightly wraps around proteins. And I can give you some of the sizes there. They're nanometer and angstrom uh, level sizes that we're talking about. And it's highly compacted so that it fills, so that it fits into the nucleus of every cell that you have, right? Uh, and so this DNA is a constant. Once again, I repeat, every cell has the same DNA. Your DNA is your DNA. Every cell in your body has the same DNA your DNA is different from my DNA, okay? And that, dis and that kind of explains to us the uh, differences that we all share amongst each other. So uh, this is basically to show you structurally how it is organized and where it sits. Um, I guess the rest of the talk will assume that you have followed me so far and, and, uh, and that this is a basic that you're all uh, going to be familiar with. Um, Everyone has a stereotypical organization of these A, T, G, C bases up to 3 billion times, and it is unique to them, and it is something that's consistent across every cell that they have, okay? And there is a technology called DNA sequencing. Uh, one of the companies that I worked with that uh, Sushila mentioned, Illumina, uh, is, is the inventor and the, uh, I guess, the is, is given all the credit for making uh, DNA sequencing uh, uh, something that is accessible to everybody today. So I spent a lot of my time working with that organization to actually bring DNA sequencing uh, to large laboratories in India uh, about uh, a decade ago. Uh, and since then, many, many facilities in India have adopted the technology. And what I will, con what I will proceed to explain going forward, apart from a brief uh, deviation, is, uh, is exactly how this DNA uh, how this application of DNA sequencing uh, is actually going to run applications and what applications there are and how it can save lives. So I shall proceed to the topic, which is genomics and disruption. Uh, briefly, genomics is anything to do with DNA. Okay, so the science that's involved in the structure of the DNA, in the expression of the DNA, in the interpretation of DNA is all genomics, right? And so the studies involving DNA is called genomics. And of course, disruption may be a word many of you have heard. Uh, uh, I will just briefly describe it. Uh, I'll just define it and I'll read it off my slide. A disruptive innovation is an innovation that creates a new market and value network and eventually disrupts an existing market and value network, thereby displacing an established market leader and alliance, right? Uh, just want to call out here, not all innovations are disruptive, right? Uh, uh, some of them may even be revolutionary. They may change the way we see things, but they may not be disruptive. So it's important that uh, a disruptive technology actually displaces a pre-existing technology, all right? And keeping that in mind, uh, I'll give you a very famous example. Uh, 
before the uh, 1900s, everybody uh, used to travel by horse cart or bullock cart or ox cart if they wanted to travel for longer distances, right? Uh, in the, um, I guess, late 1800s, Carl F. Benz had invented the internal combustion engine. Automobiles were being made. And the innovation of the automobile was revolutionary in that at that point of time. However, it was not yet disruptive. It required the entry of Ford to actually come in, mass produce um, uh, automobiles to a certain scale so that, that they would become affordable. And then, of course, uh, it disrupted the entire uh, mobility industry, right? And so today, you and I don't even uh, you know, bother uh, you know, looking for horses and cows and other things to, to travel uh, based on this disruption that took place in the early 1900s. Uh, just wanted to use this as a more common example. Of course, there are several other examples of disruption uh, that we are all used to and maybe that we've all overlapped with. Uh, maybe the television was one of them. Maybe refrigeration was one of them. And, you know, we can the, the list may be endless, but it's really important to understand that something uh, uh, that a disruptive technology replaces something that was there before. So as a precursor to uh, any disruption, there has to be a bit of a revolution. And this slide captures that revolution. Uh, don't bother reading the slide. I will summarize it for you. Basically in 1990, the National Institute of Health in, in the US decided that they wanted to understand the organization of the ATGCs in the human being. Right. So they wanted to decipher the human genome. They wanted to know how it is organized. So they started this project in 1990. They budgeted $3 billion for this and, and 15 years to complete this project. Two things happened as an outcome. One is they finished this project in, 30, in 13 years. Okay, So they did it before time. So in 2003, they had decoded the human genome. And they did it at 0.3 billion dollars less, right? So they did it under budget. Uh, at the at this point in 2003, to be very honest with you, just to date myself, I was doing at that time cutting edge research in this space in the Indian Institute of Science, and I can tell you for a fact that this was the this was the discovery that was going to change everything. The future was bright. We could find down find out the genetic basis of every kind of disease, and we could solve it. Right? That was the whole hope. But it's been now two decades since then, and we are making significant progress, but we had to have a lot of learning in the last two decades. What did happen in, uh, after 2003, and this paper was a very famous paper, what did happen after 2003 was the concept of disruption. So technology companies jumped into this space, and they realized that by combining uh, improved resolution of CCD cameras, and uh, 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 you know, um, sort of uh, uh, using the same old biochemistry of the uh, olden days, they could combine these two project, these two activities, and generate large amounts of sequence information. Uh, and as a result of which, the technologies kept improving. And as you can see in this chart, what cost over a hundred million dollars back in the day to sequence one, uh, uh, what could have cost extremely high amounts. Back in the day, now now costs in in 2015 came down to a thousand dollars per genome. I can tell you, after 2015 and now 2023, I can sequence a human genome for 250 or 300 dollars overnight in 24 hours. So if tomorrow you come to me and you want your DNA sequenced, this is how much it will cost you, 300 dollars, and this is how much time it will take. OK, so we've come a long way. And why it's really important to understand this concept of disruption is because lowered pricing brings accessibility with increased accessibility um, brings in increased applications. And then, of course, we have to try and understand what applications can this deliver to us. And I'll spend the rest of my talk talking about that. All right. So. Briefly, there is a Moore's law, uh, which I won't talk about now. It applies to semiconductors, but um, the disruptive uh, pro potential of genome sequencing, given its uh, uh, um, its trajectory, far beats what Moore's law predicts. So it's a it's an extremely disruptive technology, 
right? And like I mentioned, these are some of the technologies that happened, uh, uh, you know, in the timeline when this disruption was taking place. And uh, companies like Illumina, where I have worked as uh, the commercial head in India, um, have developed uh, engineering and other prowesses that make this, like I said, uh, today available to you uh, for in 24 hours for $300. I'll pause a second for those who who didn't <laughs> follow everything I said and 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 read this slide out? Uh, Two point seven billion years ago is the exact number, but the supreme creator, if you believe in that, or, or or a creation force, if you believe in that, created this book of life that we call DNA. Okay. In the twenty first century, now you can see how long later we figured out how to read it. Between two thousand three and two thousand twenty three, in the last two decades. We have learned to read the entire human book of life and we can even spell check it. <laughs> okay. And while we spend what we have, what we are going to do in the next few decades is to spend time to understand what this means. And if we, if we can incrementally modify this book of life, can it change our lives forever for the better? Genome sequencing. And DNA sequencing and genomics has applications in all these areas, biopharma, cancer, complex disease, consumer genomics, forensics, genetic health. And of course, I can't spend the rest of your time telling you all about this. I'm fascinated. So I happen to have jumped into this and spent many years researching and working with many, many parts of these, um, many parts of these circles that you see out here. However, just for today, I thought it would be useful uh, to just talk about four areas in which genomics is applied and get you all up to speed on these applications. So I'll pause for a second. The, any questions on DNA, where it is found, uh, uh, what is it composed of, and what has been uh, outside of the cost, what has been the biggest factor uh, that calls it a disruptive force? Is, if there are no questions, I can proceed. Wait for one more second. A sure question. What do you mean by spell check? Um, so effectively, there is an organization of these letters in your alphabet of life, right? Uh, and every now and then you have variations. There's a difference between your uh, your organization and mine. So if you have ATGC, I may have AGTC at a particular place, right? And that, of course, distinguishes you from me at one level. It could also be something that decides that I have a particular disorder and you don't, right? Uh, very often you may have heard the word mutation, right? It's kind of politically incorrect after all these X-Men series have come out to call people mutants, right? So we use the word variation very often in the field, uh, but variation equals mutation if that helps you understand better, right? So what... What we do when we organize or rather recharacterize the DNA of an individual is we actually look at the order in which these ATGCs are organized and we call out areas where they are different. That's the spell check. If no further questions, I'll proceed. So uh, the most direct application of genomics is in genetic disease. Okay, so uh, genetic diseases are caused by mutations or variations in genes. Genes are discrete parts of DNA whose function is well known and well known to be involved in certain cellular functions. So um, a gene has to have a stereotypical organization of these ATGCs. And when there is something remiss in that, that happens for many reasons, right? But when there is something remiss in that, uh, the product of that gene, which is invariably a protein, uh, will will have something wrong with it and the downstream impacts on the cellular metabolism and other aspects of what that protein is involved in uh, will will manifest in the form of some kind of clinical disorder right so uh, people who suffer from genetic disease uh, one of the characteristics is that it will run in families right so uh, you will see people people having the same disorder in in a family uh, that's one thing and one example i give here is hemophilia uh, very pop, very sort of notorious because it was called a royal disease because it existed in the royal family. So uh, Queen Victoria was uh, uh, famously a hemophiliac, right? 
um, uh, and the disorder itself uh, is a disorder in which um, uh, the um, hemoglobin, uh, the sorry, the uh, uh, clotting factors uh, uh, that we all have, which are normally present when we have any kind of rupture in our blood vessels, they clot the blood and and prevent um, you know um, bleeding. Um, those though that particular aspect of uh, the biology is impaired as a result of which uh, you have incessant bleeding and that can result in uh, in death right so you have i mean at first anemia and of course downstream could even result in death right so um, uh, that's an example of a genetic disease uh, and uh, back to your point uh, sushila uh, if we do a spell check and we find that the spelling is wrong in that gene uh, then we know that such and such person may be uh, diagnosed with a particular genetic disease. Okay, so uh, just elaborate a little. The reason why I pulled this out uh, is more for the for the magic of genomics. But there is a disease called sickle cell anemia, right? Uh, this is, an, uh, of course, there is a you know it's a gene that's involved in. Um, there are many genes involved in making uh, hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is the protein that is involved in carrying the oxygen in your blood, in your in your red blood cells. So when um, a person suffers from sickle cell anemia, if you look at this picture here, instead of having normal um, uh, RBC in, uh, in the blood, you'll see the sickle, sickle cell shaped thing. Now, what you see uh, with your eyes here under this microscope is just the shape uh, and hence the name of the disease. But the the clinical impairment is that it, that particular cell can no longer carry oxygen efficiently, and so such people are invariably anemic. Uh, in addition, the shape of that cell is uh, not conducive to the regular flow of blood. Uh, if you think of uh, our uh, blood flowing in our blood vessels as water flowing in a pipe, uh, the these odd shaped uh, um, cells create all kinds of physical obstructions, even. Uh, and result in many impairments, which uh, I kind of call out here in the bottom part of this. Uh, this. The symptoms can be fatigue and decreased hemoglobin. That's from anemia, straight up. You get an increased susceptibility to bacterial infections, leg ulcers, uh, the spleen, which is, an, which is an organ involved in cleaning up these uh, improperly formed RBCs, gets packed up and backed up with, uh, with, uh, with the activity that it's supposed to do, and it just packs up. The spleen just uh, gives up. Uh, and so you have a whole bunch of these cells roaming around. So all these impairments that you find, you'll have bouts of pain. And of course, you can have swelling and inflammation. Uh, and there can be some pulmonary and heart diseases as well that come as a result of this. So this is about the disease. But the disease is caused by a mutation in a gene, the hemoglobin gene. And the magic of genomics, because we know today what the stereotypical organization should be the 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 uh, arrangement of these letters has to be a certain in a certain order um, it is gene sequencing that allows us to understand that a, a person who suffers from hemophilia uh, the hemoglobin gene has uh, a spelling mistake in it and the big change in the last two months is that we can now use a concept called gene editing uh, and this is a way in which we can actually change the structure <laughs> of the gene. Um, uh, so we can replace the spelling mistake with the current, with the correct spelling and reintroduce these. So this is done in stem cells, bone marrow stem cells, reintroduce these into bone marrow and allow the proper uh, organized, well-organized uh, and uh, structured hemoglobin to populate, repopulate the human being. So two things that are really significant in this. You are actually manipulating this person's DNA, hence it's called gene editing. Two, you are bringing relief to this person by reintroducing the modified DNA into this person, right? And therefore alleviating any clinical symptoms that they may have, right? The big point in this is, of course, this the FDA approved two gene therapies for sickle cell disease two months ago. This technology is now available to you. If you were born, whatever, if you had this disease 20 years ago, it was hopeless, right? You had you had to find other ways in which uh, you could control and manage having hemophilia. Anyone born as of two months ago can now have an option to have almost a cure-like situation in which you can re 
compensate uh, an individual with the correct gene. This is a huge monumental moment. And it's all an outcome of us having spent a lot of time organizing DNA, understanding the organization of DNA, and now knowing how to fix it. Okay. Uh, in a similar format, uh, um, uh, I mean, this is a few more details. Let's not go into this right now. In a similar format, hemophilia too is caused by a modification um, in, um, in, the, in the clotting factors. And in a similar way, uh, not the same exact uh, genetic editing way, there is another way in which one can introduce a healthy copy of the gene into, into humans. Uh, it's a, it's a virus-mediated uh, method. And these methods can, a person who's suffering from hemophilia can now have a nor have normal clotting factors also expressed in their body and they can get immense relief from this. This too, last month, uh, this was like maybe a two-year-old uh, uh, approval. The federal uh, uh, drug agency in America has um, approved this therapy as well uh, for this particular disorder. Right. So we are in the genomics era today. It is genomics that has made all these spelling mistakes, first of all, uh, highlightable. And of course, now we have the technologies in that space to go and fix it. Uh, I've put some famous personalities, including Queen Victoria down there, who, who were hemophiliacs. Right. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, we can always revisit this because the technology used here is also very fascinating. But I'll just skim over it for the time being in the interest of time. In a very similar format, there are certain cardiovascular diseases that are also inherited. They're called inherited cardiovascular diseases. There are about 14 or 15 such well-defined inherited cardio cardiovascular diseases, and there are a whole bunch of genes that are known to be involved in the onset of those cardiovascular diseases. For those of you who are technically uh, oriented, there are cardiomyopathies, arrhythmias, and so on, uh, aortopathies, right? But there is also a very interesting one called familial hypercholesteremia, right? This is a, it's a genetic disorder that's inherited from generation to generation. Um, there are three genes that are known to be involved in, uh, in the onset of uh, familial hypercholesteremia. Um, um, you have to understand biologists are not very um, creative when it comes to calling these things. So hypercholesteremia simply means you have a lot of cholesterol. Okay. Uh, and uh, it's not a good thing to have increased levels of cholesterol. So, um, uh, first of all, um, arteriosclerotic cardiovascular disease is, a, is the number one cause of death, okay, worldwide. And now, infectious diseases are no longer the highest. It's all uh, chronic diseases. And amongst the chronic diseases, it is um, CVD that is the highest uh, in terms of uh, uh, cause of death. Hundreds and millions of patients all over the world. Right. But what happens with the person who has inherited familial hypercholesteremia, the genes involving LDR? So uh, let's say a PCSK9 gene has a uh, has an issue with it, a spelling mistake in it. What happens? And I'll draw your attention to the graph on the right. A person who would normally collect this bad cholesterol over time and by the age of 55 and 60, May their, their, the arteries in their heart get clogged with this cholesterol, as shown by this uh, little picture here, and prevents proper blood flow in and out, right? Um, uh, you can uh, imagine that this causes the hypertension that uh, many of us, at least the older ones here, are aware of. We're all taking statins at some level, right, uh, to some degree. Uh, so most people who would experience a cardiac incident in, by the age of 60 or 65 because of the development of these plaques um, which are pre, which are delayed by using giving people statins and of course once it goes too far people put stents and of course open heart surgeries and is the final call but for people who have cardiovascular disease this is the kind of timeline the thin line is the kind of timeline in which these things will occur people who have familial hypercholesteremia will develop a 55 year old 60 year olds uh, cholesterol level by, by the age of 25, 30 itself. Okay, so the odds are against these people making it all the way here unless some kind of intervention is there. And like I said, we have statins and other things that, that uh, clinicians will provide. This particular company called Verve, I just put a little uh, sign for it here, 
is actually got a trial in place to use the same gene editing technology that I described to you earlier, right? And change the spelling mistake in the PCSK9 gene. And their trials, I mean, uh, before you do uh, human trials, it's right now in phase two trials. Um, uh, and we'll, we'll know the answer to this in the coming months. So everyone keep your eyes and ears peeled, right? But uh, the, the ramifications of this kind of intervention are huge to people suffering from these types of diseases, okay? Uh, the, the, uh, before you do clinical trials on humans, you have to do this in animals. And the animal studies have been phenomenally successful uh, using this technology. Right. And as you know, from the success of the earlier technologies that I mentioned, both in sickle cell anemia, it's the same principle of uh, uh, spell check and correcting the spelling mistakes. Uh, so going forward, imagine a world where today's pharma world is all about chemistry. Right. Uh, can I put a chemical in you and change a particular biological parameter? Uh, it's very likely that tomorrow's cures will all be biology. And genomics will be the cornerstone on which all that biological intervention is built and developed on. I'll go, so break the ice, I'll go a little into infectious disease because all of you will be familiar with how genomics is used in the infectious disease world. I'll start with an example from a, from a friend who runs a hospital in Pune, uh, Nikhil Fadke. Uh, he runs a company called Gene Path, and he does a lot of this. And he he found a patient who presented with an uh, you know unidentified eye infection. It could be a bacteria, it could be a virus, it could be a fungus. There was a risk of blindness. So the immediate thing was okay. Let's start you on antibacterials, antifungus, antivirals. Let's uh, attack everything. And and this is not the best scenario for anybody, right? For various reasons. So what they did is they took a little sample of this uh, uh, tissue and uh, sequenced it. And in the sequence, they found that it was not a fungus, it was not a virus, it was a bacteria. And within eight hours, they knew this. So they only had to go for antibiotics, right? So this is the kind of thing at a very, sh at a very uh, you know, day-to-day um, -day level, uh, it removes the requirement for taking this uh, uh, um, tissue, uh, you know, culturing it in a lab, waiting for three days to, for it to grow, and then identifying the microbe behind it. If it's a virus, it's even more difficult to do. So sequencing has taken the delay out of identifying my, uh, what microbe is the causal agent. And uh, I don't have to explain this one to you. COVID-19 was identified uh, within, I think, within six days of this weird, strange disease outbreak that was taking place in China, within six days of identifying that it's some kind of uh, infectious agent. Uh, it was sequenced and identified as COVID-19. And of course, this left to tell kind of shows you the various strains that have evolved since then, making this uh, this, pan this uh, from an endemic to an epidemic to a pandemic, right? And so these all these changes, all the changes that you see here are analyzed and assessed and characterized by using DNA sequencing, which is the order in which the ATGCs of the virus are organized. Right, And it's all that information that has helped build vaccines. There may be some controversy today on whether the vaccine works, whether it doesn't work. But what there is no controversy on is that COVID-19 is the causal agent. And that's because DNA sequencing gives you that unequivocal answer. Possibly the most important uh, and well-documented um, um, application of genomics is in cancer. Right? Uh, I'll, I'll use breast cancer as an example, breast and ovarian cancer as an example of the statistics, but this applies cancer throughout all kinds of cancers, okay? Um, there'll be, you know, there's going to be close to 1.5 million cancer patients in India uh, by next year, right? Every four minutes, an Indian woman is diagnosed with breast cancer, and of course, somebody dies every 13 minutes. What is important to note is that if somebody, and I'm going to the graph here, the column graph at the bottom, if somebody is identified as stage zero, stage one, or stage two as having breast cancer, similarly with ovarian cancer, then the chance of survival is between 89 and 100%. In other words, with existing therapeutic interventions that we have in the clinic today, if I diagnose you with cancer early enough, you will live, right? Uh, and so it becomes really important to screen populations 
for mutations because a large, not a large proportion, about 10 to 15 percent of breast cancers, breast and ovarian cancers, are caused by inherited mutations in genes. Uh, famous genes in this case are the BRCA1, BRCA2 genes. I'll briefly allude to them again uh, later. But the point I'm making is that men, mostly cancer is caused by some kind of exposure to uh, a mutating agent. It could be UV light. It could be any number of things. It could be hormonal. But specifically with the case of breast cancer and ovarian cancer, a large percentage of it is caused, 15 to 20 percent of it is caused because of inherited mutations in the genes that are involved in breast cancer. So uh, people, so 10 to 20% of ovarian cancers and 6% of breast cancers are caused by heritable mutations in the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. If I were to screen a population today, the Indian population today for BRCA1, BRCA2 without any symptom, I am likely to diagnose 250,000 people with potential to develop breast cancer. Now, if I can diagnose them now as potential to develop a higher risk to develop breast cancer, can I not have them monitored a little closely compared to the other people? Can I not put them on, you know, give, get them a mammogram every year as opposed to it? The cost is not that much, but the, the outcome can be in saving lives, right? And it is this type of scenario that has prompted Strand and myself in Strand to bring a product out, which I'll talk to you about a little later, it's just a page on it. Uh, let me just finish the biology of BRCA1 and, and what it causes, what it means to people. The people who carry mutations in BRCA have a 17 to 44% risk for ovarian cancer and a 72% risk for getting breast cancer. And of course, medical guidelines suggest that those who test positive should undergo screening more frequently. And the screening we're talking about is uh, both physical as well as mammograms. Um, it may even result in radiology. And they say that you should even consider risk-reducing surgeries. And on that subject, let me introduce you someone that many of you may have heard about, Angelina Jolie, uh, who actually uh, did life-changing, uh, risk-reducing double mastectomy and salpingo-ophorectomies, that is removal of the fallopian tubes, right, as a preventative way before she got it, before she actually ended up getting breast cancer or ovarian cancer. Uh, her family history was that her mother, aunt and grandmother, great grandmother, all died of gynecological cancers. So the chances that she would get it were super, super high, right? And she has been the poster child for um, advocating for genetic testing so that people, so that lives can be saved and people can live full and uh, successful uh, lives. And she is that poster child for that opportunity. This is a brief uh, deviation from cancer screening, genetics cancer screening, um, or, uh, inherited cancer screening, which I mentioned earlier. Uh, this is the wave of tomorrow. I could not not tell you guys about this. Uh, there is, uh, when cancer cells shed, uh, when tumor, when cancers shell, shed tumor cells into the blood, uh, the tumor, uh, the blood of the DNA from these uh, cancer cells uh, floats around in the blood of you and me. Suppose I had a cancer today that the the DNA of that cancer is floating around and the technology is there today to isolate that DNA and identify that you have a cancer. So this, what it does is it identifies cancer preemptively before you have clinical symptoms. And so if we all had this test once a year going forward, we'd be able to catch a cancer, a potential cancer early, and of course, get onto a surveillance program, right? So these are all ways in which genomics, and it's the it's the sequencing of this DNA that's in the blood, which is AKA genomics, which is responsible for telling us uh, that we may be uh, uh, susceptible to getting this disease or not, right? Many, many lives can be saved, impacted. 1.5 million cancer patients out there, we have 70 million people with rare diseases, Right? There are several, uh, several things, uh, uh, several huge uh, global impacts and societal impacts that we can have. But let me just take a second to describe, this is my second last slide, how genetic testing has saved lives, not in America, not in Johns Hopkins, not in all those places, because it has saved lives there, but right here in Chamarajnagar, right? And how genetic testing and genetic screening uh, by a well-meaning Dr. Deepa Butt and, of course, the um, 
um, the author of this article, Chetana Balgare, uh, uh, they realized, the government realized that there were a large case, a large number of cases of xeroderma pigmentosa, which is a genetic disorder, uh, showing up in kids from this particular village, uh, particular district, uh, uh, Chamraj Nagar. And they adopted it. They actually uh, uh, did a complete clinical uh, sort of uh, with a team of dermatologists and ophthalmologists. They went there and genetic counselors. They went and completely characterized the population. They recommended genetic tests and evaluations. And of course, they're using genetic tests, counseling and future prevention as their mandate. And this uh, is the kind of work that can be done. They've actually been able to identify because these are genetic diseases. These things run in families. So there's an ability to identify families that are more susceptible, children that are more susceptible, and of course, uh, what kinds of things can be done to prevent uh, those uh, children from, um, you know, from from conception of children who actually have this, uh, these types of genetic disorders. Uh, it's important for me to bring this up because this is how uh, I actually met Sushila <laughs> at Arogya. This is a product that Strand makes. Uh, the fact that uh, Strand, uh, where I work, is a diagnostic company, uh, uh, used to work in a space where when clinicians have a doubt, they send us a sample and then we do a confirmation, right? So if some somebody has a tissue biopsy for a cancer, uh, the doctor suspects that this could be an inherited cancer, they send the blood sample over. And we, very often we found that we were confirming that a person actually had a germline risk or a familial risk for getting that cancer. Uh, we decided with 20 years of experience in that space that it's not enough to keep confirming for doctors that people actually have germline cancers. We might actually be able to impact societies if we screen healthy people for genes and gene mutations, aka spelling mistakes uh, in DNA. Uh, and of course, uh, characterize whether they have an increased risk for hereditary cancer, or hereditary cardiovascular disease, metabolic disorders. And then there are two other aspects which I haven't talked about today. One is pharmacogenomics and carrier risk screening, which may require an entire discussion on its own. But this test is now available, made available by us. Anyone can uh, take this test. Um, it, the cost of this test is 15,000 rupees. So it's fairly affordable. Uh, and you can actually understand uh, either from curiosity or whether you have a fear of familial history, whatever it is, you can take this test and you can try and understand what your spelling errors are. If there are any, there may not be any. Uh, and of course, we have a way in which we roll this out, right? We are, you can just go on to our website, sign up for it. Uh, someone comes and picks up your sample and 21 days later, we deliver your result to you on a software. Okay. Uh, I'll end with a quote from William Gibson. The future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. Uh, and we are trying to find ways to equitably distribute uh, this future to everybody here. Uh, on this call, uh, those of you who are interested, uh, I've decided we, we will put on a discount of 15,000 rupees. We'll make it, we'll make it 11,500 rupees for anyone on this call. Uh, you can just go to that link. Uh, you can take a screenshot of it and use that coupon code. Uh, and with that, I will stop and take a breath while you can probably ask me some questions. If there are any. Do you please stop the screen sharing? Yeah, one second. Thank you. So totally new, new what should I say? New, new domain for me, at least I can say, uh, not cancer per se, but uh, the subject and how advanced the science has become today. And we can really take precaution much before actually we are affected. And it's a new knowledge for me. <laughs> Frankly speaking, it's a knowledge for me. And I'm sure I'm going to talk to many people about what I heard today. Not that every, each and every slide that you presented, I have really followed, okay, from the science point of view. But definitely in a nutshell, whatever I have heard this thing. Yeah. I have just one question. You see, there are certain diseases which we say that it's um, uh, hereditary. Yeah. And that is where, where your DNA, I think, comes in. Yeah. Now, 
is it possible or is it uh, it has to be like that that uh, whatever is hereditary will happen automatically to the progeny's uh, next generation or uh, yes it just can a chance uh, uh, so it's it's a great question um uh, there are many ways in which a gene can be passed on from one generation to the other um, there are different types of genes. There are what we call autosomal recessive genes. We call autosomal dominant genes, right? So a recessive gene, uh, just to give you a background, um, everyone has two copies of DNA. Uh, to quote my earlier example, when I said we have 3 billion letters, we actually have 6 billion letters. 3 billion comes from mom, 3 billion comes from dad, right? And, and we have identical sort of matching gene sets from mom, matching gene sets from dad. Uh, there is a group of genes where if if mom's copy is bad and dad's copy is good or vice versa, then that person does not suffer from the disease because the good copy takes over the job of the bad copy, right? Uh, these are what are called autosomal recessive diseases. And the person who has this one good copy, one bad copy, that person is called a carrier because they're carrying one copy that is bad. Now, the, uh, using the laws of genetics, if this person marries another person who has one good copy and one bad copy, then by probabilistically, 25% of the time, both these bad copies can come together, in which case the child will manifest the clinical disorder. Right? And so technology is there today in IVF and other worlds where one can identify before uh, anything else, uh, whether an embryo has both the mutations, you know, uh, both genes, mothers and fathers have, and via IVF, you can implant the embryo that doesn't have the mutation, right? So, so there are, I mean, there's technology to wazoo now. You can, you, you, there is no reason to have a disease, a genetic disorder going forward if the screening has been done thoroughly, right? Uh, but what I, in, in response to your question, it's not a hundred percent chance in all cases. When people actually have what is called an autosomal dominant uh, um, uh, gene disorder, so there's a different group of genes. Uh, the breast cancer genes I mentioned, BRCA1, BRCA2, for example, they are dominant. So even one bad copy is bad news. And that too can get diluted uh, in you know, generation to generation, or it can get uh, concentrated depending on, on the spouse uh, status for the same gene. Right. So uh, so there is always a chance. Ch genetics always gives you a chance to escape or a chance to get it. What this testing does is it removes the chance out. It takes out the chances. Right. And it makes it much more certain in terms of screening right. out the bad mutations. Right. Great question. Thank you for asking me. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you for explaining in, in such layman's language. <laughs> I'm sure... Many of us may have many questions. So, yeah. Ashok, uh, this is uh, Vinod John here. Hi, Vinod. First of all, first of all, thank you for a wonderful talk. I think uh, I must commend you for the articulation, the way you have articulated such a complex topic. I, I think you heard it many times before. Uh, you very wonderfully articulated. Thank you. Uh, I want I want to show off a little bit that I happen to be, have worked for a company called Cytogenomics, which was a uh, dealing wow. with silicocyte so I'm but impressed. in a different area altogether <laughs> but my my question is i was the other day sitting with a few people they was talking about uh interviews of science uh doing some studies and tests on people where they could actually test anybody for understanding the possibility of cancer at any stage in life probably very well in the future yeah uh, is this the same thing that you're talking yes, about at yes. Strand? Uh, yes. Number yes. two, the second part of the question is, how early or how late is it should be for you to find, is there a possible, if, the, if you were to find something, is there a genetic change that can happen at that, this point of time? Or is there a cure for anything that you would probably find at this point of time? Or yeah. are you going to just find out and stay depressed the rest of your life? Right, right. Uh, both great questions. Thank you, Vinod. Um, uh, thanks for your questions. The first one is, um, yes, uh, it, it no longer is in the realm of the premier research institute, aka IISE, uh, 
to be in the space of what we call liquid biopsies, right? Which I had mentioned earlier and which is what you alluded to, which is a simple blood test that talks about the imminent onset of, of a cancer, right? Uh, there, is a, there is a pioneer in the space called Grail. It's a company called Grail. I had alluded to it in the slide uh, that you can look up if you want further information. But um, and the and the um, the clinical study trial was actually published in Lancet about two months ago, right? So it's a very interesting paper to read. Uh, the technology is not there yet, Vinod, right? We are we, we it's called multi cancer early detection (MCED). It's abbreviated, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that the, we are not there yet where we can figure out every cancer uh, okay. just by ch checking your blood. But mm -hmm. but I'd say in the next decade we will be there. That's how fast things are improving. Uh, and then you and I, uh, as healthy people, can qualify to do this test once a year and understand whether there is going to be an imminence of onset of a cancer. Right Now, this is outside the germline genetic inherited cancer space. This is anybody who gets cancer. So for all the various reasons we can get cancer, chewing, right. pan, drinking alcohol, smoking cigarettes, whatever that may be. Right? What we call somatic uh, mutations that appear. Right. So so to that extent, I would say that uh, the technology is there. It's being improved constantly and sooner or later we'd get there. It's particularly relevant in cancers like pancreatic cancer, which are very difficult uh, to even to get a biopsy tissue from. Right. And are very difficult to detect early because they're so deep inside and you don't know till th things have gone too badly wrong. Right. And, mm -hmm. and, and Steve Jobs is an example of the outcome. You know, no amount of money can save mm -hmm. you at that point of time. Right. Uh, so so early detection in certain specific types of cancers, even the uh, neurological cancers are really important to understand early enough. And I think uh, this technology will change that space forever. Uh, it will be wonderful to say, I, 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 if I can dare say it, no one will die of cancer going in the future. Right. Wow. Uh, but um, uh, but of course, the biology is wonderful. We'll find other ways to die. <laughs> right. But, uh, Thank you for that. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, uh, your second question. Uh, could you just repeat it, just to remind me? I'm sorry. Yeah. Is is there a is there a when you find these cancers uh, at this stage, oh, yeah. is there yeah. a cure or yeah. is it that you just know about it and leave it at that? Yeah. So so the idea of finding it early is because current, uh, let's say, let's say breast cancer, for example, you can do re risk reducing surgery in advance, uh, a, a, a la Angelina Jolie. Right. So so that prolonged her life for, for a heck of a long time. Right. Now, there are other cancers where you may you can't do as much. Uh, one of the cancers that is known to be very good when you to, uh, very treatable when you catch early is colon cancer. Right. So the concept of a colonoscopy, right, uh, an endoscopic kind of uh, probe that goes right. into your intestines to understand the polyp structures and so on and so forth. Right. So these are all these are all cancers that have very good prognostic outcomes when detected early. Right. Okay. There are others like pancreatic cancer, unfortunately, that don't have the same story to tell. And uh, as we continue to research in that space, I'm sure we'll we'll find the key in there as well. Uh, will it lie in genomics or will it lay somewhere else uh, in a new technology? I don't know. I I beg that it will happen in genomics, but it may be somewhere else as well. Thank you, Ashok. Thank, Thank you once you. again. For wonderful talk. Thank you, Vinod. Do we have any more question? I just had one question. Yeah. What about eyesight? Yes. <laughs> Great question. Um, <laughs> So the genetics of, let's say, something like color blindness, right, is well understood, right? And that is something that can be detected early enough. It may not have that intense an outcome. People can live being colorblind. That's not an issue, right? Uh, but uh, progressive uh, blindness and uh, those kinds of things, um, some of them are genetic uh, genetic disorders and, and have a genetic cause. And for those, yes, there is a, there is a way to detect early. Uh, going back to Vinod's, uh, I guess, um, question, is there something we can do about it right now? Uh, I may not be the best person to answer that. We'll need to talk to an ophthalmologist. Uh, but eye cancers, certainly, retinoblastoma and those kinds of uh, disorders of the eye are easy to detect early and they are genetic disorders. And of course, it's important to detect early so that we can do something about it. There are interventions that are successful. Yes. Thank you. Thank you.
Thank you. Uh, if there is no more question, I'd request uh, Rutherian Sabi to give the vote of thanks, please. Uh, after what Ashok spoke, I don't know what I have to say, but uh, all I'll say, it's a coincidence. I believe in destiny. I was supposed to be in some meeting somewhere else at seven o'clock that got canceled. So that's how I switched on, number one. Number two, Sushila, when she sent a word, Savvy, will you propose a vote of thanks? I immediately said yes, because uh, some commonality, which Ashok mentioned in the beginning, I also mentioned, we both have got three commonalities. We both are human beings. We are Rotarians. And third, I'm also from Indian Institute of Science. So I did aerospace in uh, 79 to 81. So listening to your talk, I was right in the beginning, though the topic is very tough. I knew a person from Institute of Science will make it easy. They are somehow during though their stay there are told how to make it easy. I learned it hard way. I'll tell some other time when my guide threw my 100 page thesis out of the window. He says, I want 30 pages. That's all. OK, fine. Well, <laughs> your talk, you when, when you're talking about the disruption, I thought I had known exponentially growth. Exponentially coming down is disruption. That that's something beautifully done. And I think the rate at which it happened in genomics is not happened anywhere else to my little knowledge. Well, uh, I don't know what all to pick up from your talk. Everything was absolutely informative when you talked about the diseases and particularly the spell check. I was reminded of my teacher when she used to do the corrections. And I'm happy that in today's scientific technology, even the scientists can check the mistakes, what you call the spelling mistakes. Again, a uh, good take off. And uh, when you talked about eye infections, about cancers, well, they are the areas and I'm sure future is going to be much, much brighter. And as you have said, future is already here. You have brought it down. And I think the best part of your talk was, I have been knowing about many topics when people give the latest information. For the last about 15 years, I've been doing talks on Alzheimer's, right? So I say, okay, last year this happened and now it happened. You are giving us the information which happened two weeks back, two months back. I think it's the progress is enormous. So not only me, I think you have opened all of us to a topic in genomics. Till now I knew vaguely what it is, but you have generated interest not only in me and other speakers also for that. On behalf of Rotary Club of Bangalore Cantonment, I thank you from the bottom of everybody's heart. I can't enter their hearts, but I know everybody will join me in giving you three cheers. Let's have a clap. Thank you, sir. Thank, thank you. So thank you. Thank, thank you, you once again. <laughs> thank you. Thank you so much, Doctor. Thank you. Thank for you. opening a new area of, I think, what probably we will be looking at. Wonderful mm -hmm. talk. Thank you, Doctor. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Shushila, for getting such a good speaker. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Shushila. Okay. Right. So, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Suman, are you there? Yes. Okay. So... I think we are supposed to. Is is Mithun still there or he has moved out? No, Mithun is there. Okay, he is there. Right. Uh, Suman, would you like uh, Shabir also to stay on? Uh, I have gone through his final presentation, except okay. there are a few typos. I okay. couldn't really find much. Have you gone through? Have you had time to go uh -huh, through? Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Do you need others to stay on? No, 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 no. Uh, Mithun, uh, Shabir, and uh, Shushila, if she is around, she can. The rest of the people can log off. The meeting is adjourned already. Thank you. Yeah. Shushila, would you like to stay on? You can stay on, please. But we will take another 15, 20 minutes. That's it.
Right. Yeah. Yes, um, Suman, please go ahead. Uh, Mutan. One second. Shabir has left the meeting, so if you want him to join back. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Shabir is not here. <laughs> Where did it disappear? Yeah, if he was there. Okay. Anyway, Suman, I feel that if, uh, there is nothing much to be done with his uh, presentation except yeah. correcting those ty typos. I think that can be taken care of, now. Right. So that is okay. Like like where it's supposed to be kids, he has written kids. Okay. 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 <laughs> so this is okay. kind of a few small uh, uh, typos are there, which really if you can just quickly swim through and uh, correct it, it's fine. Otherwise, the rest of the thing is okay. Whatever uh, were left out, the two blank uh, slides, he has deleted the slides you wanted him to delete, right? Yeah. And also the two blank uh, slides that he gave that he has filled up. So more or less, it's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We will okay. not touch okay. anything at this point of time. So let us start uh, this tomorrow. Okay, what they have to yeah. say, and then we will go yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Okay. Yes, Suman, you go ahead. You have a couple of things you said. Uh, main thing was uh, Mithun that day you wanted to you were talking about the budget versus actuals, no? Yeah, yeah. So I was discussing with Gargi mm -hmm. in terms of what how we should position it tomorrow and what are some of the key things that we need to present. Mm -hmm. So Gargi was saying, I mean, Gargi, you, you want to say or should I? Yeah, uh, Mithun, you must have gone through the docs I, which was prepared in my year as club secretary, right? Correct. Have you seen that? Okay, now you see, we, this is actually, the GOV is happening after six months. So yeah. we, we haven't completed the year, right? Yeah. So yeah. it's not, I think, uh, they shouldn't be asking either. We shouldn't be telling them either. That mm -hmm. what was budgeted, what we have spent, what has why it has happened, and all those analysis we do at the end of the year, right? Okay. Okay. And also at the same time, what they would like to know your last year actually. That is the more important to them. That okay. is the two reasons I think they want. One reason is they would like to know that the whether the club is on the track, you are maintaining your accounts properly, which is very, very important for all of us. And okay. the second thing is they want to know what was the kind of expenditure, income expenditure statement you had. So that we are presenting in any case, 